my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Professor Dawn Freshwater. In her role as UWA Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Dawn has been leading the renewal project for the university. Prior to joining UWA in 2014, Professor Freshwater served as the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Staff and Organisational Effectiveness, Professor of Mental Health, and Head of the School of Healthcare at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. In late 2015, following the launch of the Vice-Chancellor's paper, Securing Success, and extensive, following extensive consultation with stakeholders across the university about the future needs of UWA, Dawn was appointed to lead the UWA Renewal Project. For those present this evening who may not be fully conversant with the scope and objectives of the Renewal Project, part of the reason for inviting Dawn to address the meeting is to provide you with that information. So please welcome Professor Dawn Freshwater. May I also start by um, paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this land and by also thanking Warren uh, for the invitation and for the warm welcome to convocation which I'm delighted to be here this evening. I also do just want to comment on um, the fact that Warren and Maddie have both paid quite a lot of part in the renewal project to date and um, to thank you publicly for your interest, but more importantly for your contributions, which have been really welcomed. So um, uh, fe feeling very humbled following Neil's award, but I did recognize that as we went through the list of achievements that um, we ran through, there was in amongst all of that a note of culture change, uh, some culture change that had ha to happen as part of that football culture. And I will come to that in terms of culture change as part of this project and in talking through the aspects of the renewal process that I'll go through this evening. Now, Warren's uh, given me very strict instructions. I have to stick to time so that we can have full Q&As as part of the panel. So I have a few slides and I'll run through them and take about 15 to 20 minutes in trying to lay out some of the background to the project, but more importantly, to get to the points where we are now, which is really at the point of constructing the new faculties and providing the services to those faculties by which we'll be able to deliver the university's strategy, mission, and vision. So that's where we'll end the presentation, and I'll be very happy to take questions. And as Warren has said, I'm aware that there's been a lot coming through from convocation in terms of those questions. So I've slightly um, changed the title of the presentation, uh, and there's a good reason for that, because as the Vice-Chancellor has clearly outlined in his report this evening, heritage is really important. It's important for a number of reasons, but it's not actually set up in polarity to transformation. It might seem like the two things come up against each other, but what I'd like to talk about tonight is how they can actually work constructively together, and particularly the heritage of UWA working to help us to build the transformation platform for the future that the Vice-Chancellor spoke very clearly to earlier. And I also have put into the title of the presentation, Dueling Missions. And this is also important because the university, of course, has a social mission. But we also have a business model that we need to work within to be commercially viable. And those two missions also often seem at odds with each other. But actually, they can be brought together. And that's the work that we've been doing over the last three years. And prior to that, the vice chancellor has started building that platform to get us to this point. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the strategic direction of the university, except to remind, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but to remind you that the strategic direction was set um, and aspiring to be one of the world's top 50 global universities by 2050 is part of the vision. And we have strategic goals in each of the areas of education, research, community and engagement that we're working, striving to achieve. 
they're constantly moving, of course. And in order to, to achieve those goals, there are three key pillars. World-class staff, students with outstanding potential, and operational excellence. And each of those three pillars is quite important in terms of the renewal project. I'll come to those in turn. Just to say a little bit more about heritage and transformation and how these things align. And, um, and to note that one of the uh, pictures here is a very, very delicate balancing act, trying to pull these things together and have them in balance. I really like Napier Waller's The Five Lamps of Learning, uh, 1931. Many of you will know that this is the combination of ideas focused around the motto to seek wisdom. It's a wonderful example of some of the legacy but also heritage that we have around the campus. And in that Five Lamps of Learning, Waller talks about five of the seven virtues of wisdom. And they're very much sewn into the fabric of our strategy as we move forward. So lining that up against our 2020 vision uh, and noting that heritage is not only something that's handed down from the past as a tradition, but it's also something that we have to be proud of and have courage to continue to build. Um, balancing legacy with uh, transformation or heritage with transformation in such a process as the renewal, but as the Vice Chancellor has indicated, this will now be a continuous process for the future of the university. It's a significant challenge in regard to the development and implementation of any sustainable strategy in as uh, what the Vice Chancellor described as a national and international competitive market. So holding that tension, holding that balance, and noting that the student expectations, as already indicated, are changing in an increasingly competitive market, and that means that the university really does need to think very carefully about its future and balancing those dueling missions of social mission and maintaining a sustainable and um, a st sustainable business model, but in the service of our strategy. The dueling missions, if you're interested, is something that's come out of Harvard most recently by Julie Batania because she's actually been looking at hybrid organizations, organizations that have both this social mission and simultaneously having to pursue commercial objectives. And what she's, she's talking about here is a hybridization model. And the question she was really asking, and one of course that many uh, public sector organizations are asking, but higher education has been aski asking itself is, is it really possible to do well on the social dimension whilst engaging in co commercial activities? And of course, we have to make sure that we don't get mission drift in either of those, either by focusing on the social mission too much or focusing on the business model. So harnessing that productive tension and doing what universities do best UWA is pushing at the boundaries, not just disciplinary and knowledge boundaries, but also the edges of what constitutes education, taking account of the comment around not moving everything to be online, but also approaches to teaching and learning, modes and integration of technology with research and learning, and pushing at the edges of this, not just simply for knowledge's sake, but for the betterment of society. It may look different in the future when we do this to what, we, what it does today, but the intention and the values remain the same. And that's actually quite an important concept to grab hold of. So this is the transformation platform that we've been working on. And what you'll notice is fundamental to the transformation strategy are the heritage, values, and mission of the university backwards and into the past, but also currently. This platform has been uh, being developed over a period of time, and as the Vice Chancellor indicated, the work started some time ago and has really gained momentum over the last two years. Partly what we're attempting to achieve here through, as you can see, not just cultural change, building sector-leading capabilities across our professional staff, across our IT functions and making sure we have the 
IT capability to contend with the student expectations and our own research initiatives, reframing the cost base of the university to ensure we have funds available to invest in infrastructure in IT, but also importantly in research and staff, and preparing the university for strategic growth and strategic growth in areas that we perhaps don't know about yet. So we can prepare for strategic growth for what we already know is on the horizon, but as the Vice-Chancellor has indicated, the rapid um, changing environment that we're working within means that we also have to be prepared for the unexpected and the not known, getting ourselves in good shape to be able to respond quickly and to use the Prime Minister's term with agility. So uh, uh, one of the things that I would like to get across through tonight's presentation is when I begin to talk about some of the changes in a very practical way that have been introduced and are in process of being implemented, it's important to recognize that that is not the end game. So restructuring the university or providing a different way of delivering our services to the students and to the staff is not the end game. That's en route to actually pre preparing us for the future and being able to deliver on the vision and the mission of the university in the future in a very different way. So this is preparing us for that future that we're talking about. So one of the things that will come out of the transformation strategy in this platform is creating a fund through a strategic exercise such as this one um, in order to, have to be able to invest in for example, our, our IT infrastructure, but our campus, and improving some of our teaching facilities, but also, as I'll talk about right at the end of the presentation, a very exciting initiative in recruiting new academics into the organization to take a leadership role for the future across many discipline-specific initiatives. It's perhaps worth mentioning, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, that while we're talking about organizational change, and that's often what gets focused on when we talk about renewal, there's a tendency for it to go right down to the level of organizational change. Whilst we're in a process of significant transformation, the university is always, for example, changing incrementally, perhaps not necessarily noticeably, all the time, but through continuous improvement and really um, managing its process improvement in quite an invisible way, but it is happening all the time. And of course, we're always problem solving. What's different about this renewal project and what's quite challenging in that sense is that we're really looking at a punctuated, quite a disruptive change. And what that means is that we're not only reorientating parts of the university to slightly different foci, we're also recreating parts of the university. So on that continuum of change, we are pushing the boundaries, as I've indicated, but within that, we are always in continuous improvement and modifying and amending, and that will continue to be the case beyond the, the life cycle of this renewal. In fact, we will have better, better uh, processes and systems in place to be able to do that to ensure that we can respond. The drivers for this change that I'm talking about in renewal are plenty, and I don't want to go into detail this evening, but can do in response to questions. And the Vice-Chancellor has already indicated some of this, but I've wanted to highlight three for you in particular. The first being the need to invest in building on our existing teaching and research performance. And we do need to do that, and we've identified quite clearly where we have gaps in our performance, where we need to lift our game in terms of our teaching quality, and where it's going to be important for us to be able to provide quite a different experience for the students in the future. The university excels in research. This is a fantastic university for research intensity. That's actually a, quite a costly exercise, as many of you will know. And in order to generate funds to reinvest in research, we also need to be able to bring more students on campus 
and actually to set up a virtuous cycle. And so this is part of that process. To deliver a really high quality teaching and to be eligible for some of that really um, very hard to, to gain research grant uh, funding now, we have to have an academic structure that really allows us to deliver a multidisciplinary, innovative approach to research and teaching, bringing the two things together so that all of our teaching is not only research inspired, but is research led. Uh, it's important to recognize that all of our undergraduates, our first years, should have ac access to our best and brightest professors who are engaged in research and to bring more of those people onto the campus. Uh, and also uh, in serving all of that academic mission, the need to deliver a fit for purpose range of professional services. And we do have some excellent best practice in some of our service areas and it would be, we need to have consistency across the board in a range of those services, which are a little bit disparate at the moment and some duplication of efforts being identified through a process we went through in 2014. So three proposed changes. These being the new academic structure and that's where I'd like to spend a bit of time later as through the presentation. A methodology for evaluating academic performance was developed and the new service delivery model. Now I'll start with the middle one, the methodology for evaluating academic performance. That process has now been complete. The outcome of that means that we have a really clear explicit set of metrics that identify uh, by an international benchmark what we can expect from our staff in terms of their teaching performance and their research performance as well as their contribution to community and engagement and service. We also have developed uh, a metric for looking at leadership and we have some qualitative measures as well. And so we now have a very clear uh, foundation from which to build in terms of identifying what is the benchmark we expect for our staff to be able to deliver on teaching research and our mission, but also to recruit international staff to that benchmark. And for that to be known to be made explicit and for students coming to the university as much as staff coming to the university to really understand what's expected and the high performance culture that we're building on and developing as part of this process. The service delivery model is well and truly in the throes of development and will be, that process is now coming to a conclusion. We have about three weeks left in which we are looking at all the functions across the university, examples being HR, campus management, our IT services, all the services that provide the support for the academics to be able to deliver the excellence in teaching and research. So having a benchmark, providing staff with the support to be able to deliver that service, and then for providing the opportunities within the infrastructure and the IT for staff to be able to work within those environments to provide that sort of level of um, outcome for the students all comes together, it's all interrelated. That new service delivery model will mean that there's specific uh, specialised services that will work towards supporting the faculties and there'll be some generic central services. That's going to be a much more devolved process to make sure that we're able to deliver on those uh, particular services required in some specialist schools. So I was at the um, anatomy and physiology school today. I spent a little bit of time in the um, lab with the body uh, bequest um, team and, um, and then I went straight over to geosciences and spent some time in the labs there and then I was over in Alva and uh, talking to some staff there. Now as you would understand all of those areas have very specific needs in terms of supporting the students and making sure that that's available and understood and giving some direction around that is critical. Having said that, the HR, IT, campus management, all the uh, back office functions, 
that are provided could actually be quite generic across those areas. And what we're wanting to do is to make sure that we provide the best possible services for students, for our researchers and for our academic staff to be able to deliver uh, what, what they're appointed to do and to ensure that a lot of the other work remains seamless and, and whilst it's invisible, really important in terms of achieving our strategy. The benefits of the proposed change are numerous, but I've wanted to highlight two or three here before I talk about the academic restructure. So it, it obviously is important for us to highlight that there'll be significant financial savings for investment back into the university as part of this process. But that's not the only driver. The academic organizational structure that we're working on not only maximizes cross-disciplinary working, in other words, it creates low walls for boundary or boundaries for academics to work across. It actually maximizes the potential for academic coherence across a number of disciplines. And when they come together, working together in a coherent way and across discipline, it maximizes the potential for that to achieve a step change in our research and teaching at a national and an international level dealing with some of the global challenges. The end-to-end -end services mean that everybody within the service area, under everybody understands their role, the expectations, what's required of them and their accountabilities. But more importantly, part of the culture is that everybody within the services knows what, how they're contributing to achieving the university strategy and their particular part that they play in that success. And that's really important. It's an important part of role satisfaction, job satisfaction, but it's also a part of creating the environment within which students can feel that they're part actually of a university that has a global mind, but also a caring heart. The funding that I'm talking about pulling out of this project will provide us with the ability to appoint 50 strategic academic positions. This will be to scale up our research, but also, um, importantly, to help us with innovations in teaching and to improve the teaching quality and to provide different approaches to teaching. And so important that we're able to reinvest that funding in a way that is really directly going to benefit the university through um, its strategy in leadership in education and leadership in research. As I've said, they're all interrelated. Well, I can assure you that having all these cogs turn at the same time is not easy. And of course, um, it's a lot to be contending with all at the same time. Having said that, they're so interrelated that taking one part of this uh, machine, such as the academic restructure, and looking at it in isolation from the service structure and not thinking about it in terms of the future and the high performance culture would have meant that we would have had gaps uh, and cracks through which things may have fallen down in terms of business continuity, but also ensuring that we're working across a seamless approach to the university's um, experience for students and staff. And so taking account of that, it was important to, to actually pull all of this together under one umbrella and to run the project all at the same time in year. The other thing it does is it minimizes the disruption. Melbourne have actually undertaken a very similar, similar project and they took three years to run this project. And in those three years, they are still getting to the point where they're thinking about um, their academic performance metrics. So this is quite disruptive to core business. It's also um, important to think about the impact on staff morale and culture in that process. And so a decision was taken, lessons learned, not to, to undertake the renewal project in that vein. OK, so this is really hot off the press. And um, the reason being is because it's going to academic board for discussion and debate on Wednesday of next week. So it is a proposal, so I, I will just 
put that caveat around this, but this was the third part of this project, which was to restructure the faculties, and for many reasons, which I'm very happy to talk about, but I wanted to give you a sense of the way it's shaping up at the moment. And so you'll see there are four faculties, and within those faculties, uh, there are some proposals for schools coming together, and coming together in quite a different way, but also as a way of bringing disciplines together and thinking about how to prepare the university for the future, both in terms of its research uh, strengths and its teaching priorities and ways in which we might build future programs, courses, that actually build on those strengths. So we've also done some work through the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, Robin Owens, on looking at our research strengths, where we excel, building on those, and under the auspices of the education portfolio, we've undertaken a review of our new courses and understand where we have to build on the, on the benefits that they've provided for us, bringing those things together and using those to inform part of the discussion around the proposals for the faculties and its substructures. So you can see this is quite a change from where we are now, particularly, for example, in the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences. Uh, this is uh, really uh, uh, preparing the faculty for delivering quite a different shape to its future programs and pulling together areas of research strengths like population and global health, where we have a long track record of using data to inform those sorts of areas, bringing them together. Um, I'll leave you to have a look at that for a moment, but uh, what I'd really like to say about this structure in the context of our strategy is that we all know that solutions to the important problems of the world, which, of which there are many, and they're all, always changing, increasingly depend on collaboration and creativity and building inclusive teams that cultivate ambitions, not just of their own uh, academic staff and colleagues, but cultivate the ambitions of our students because that's where we're succession planning for the future of this research teaching nexus. And in pulling this proposed faculty together, it actually, we have given some thought to how we can prepare ourselves to solve some of the solutions of the problems of the world, contribute to that at least, but cultivate ambitions and build inclusive teams in order to enhance our research and teaching uh, product and productivity. I want to just um, finish with one or two more slides and points uh, of excitement, actually. Uh, many of you will probably know, but I will say it anyway, uh, leading academics, so leading academics in their field are excellent in their dis discipline. But not all leading academics are academic leaders. In other words, they're not always the best managers and they're not always going to be the best people um, actually to put into an organization in order to, to lead a, a unit or to be an administrator. The university, and, and I, I've, I've put these two things uh, side by side, I think it's really interesting that you know, three years ago when we were, I was looking through the 100 treasures from UWA uh, as I was preparing for this presentation, looking at some of the wonderful things in there. And um, I thought it was really interesting to put this alongside the fact that what we're really talking about at the end of this year and into the, to the new year is generating 50 new treasures of a different sort. And in that, um, thinking about 50 new academic appointments, Academics with impact, that's really important because the government, as many of you will be familiar with, are investing in research that translates into outcomes uh, uh, for, the, for the public, but also end user outcome. Academics with impact into industry, academics with impact into society. And to do that through what UWA does really well, which is data intensive discovery. And thinking about those two themes as guiding principles for us in terms of our new appointments and having a blend of appointments. So it is important to have highly cited researchers. That's important for our rankings and it's also important for us to attract 
high quality PhD students uh, and in addition international researchers. But uh, we also need to focus on having a blend of research led and research inspired teaching academics, building on that uh, benchmark that I was talking about earlier and importantly educational innovators. So having a real mix of, of staff coming in into those new appointments and generating some new appointments, new appointments for this university but not new appointments necessarily for the sector. So industry professors and professors of practice. These are experts in their field who may have come from a, a slightly different path and a slightly different trajectory into their areas of expertise. So I'm going to stop there and I, I'm happy to take questions as part of the panel discussion, but I wanted to end with this note really, which is a recognition that the future meets the past in the present. And, um, and I actually really like this um, image here of uh, the, the, the digital meeting the human. And I was really mindful of what Neil said, which was going to fully online and everything being robotic and automated. You know, it's not necessarily, I think, where any university would want to see themselves. But finding a way to actually achieve the blend that means that we have something really quite unique there. Again, it's a balancing act, but it is an important one to achieve. And it's one that the university is working on embracing and seeing its future as being an innovator in this space. I want to end by returning to values. Uh, we, I started that, the presentation with that and in undertaking this change. I think it's important to return to values. We have a values-led strategy. That will need to be foreground in the context of the digital and virtual revolution that underpins such things as massive online courses and work environments where many people will no longer be tethered to their desk. As part of that, respect is going to be fundamental to the organization, and it is our expectation as an executive that leaders at all levels, including the new leaders coming into the organization, will set their tone, the tone through their own actions and communications such that we are act actively generating students who are citizens of the future. Thank you.